Morning, everybody. As we go to the chitas of today, we are holding the sixth reading. Today's Friday, the sixth reading of Pashas Shemini. And we are holding on chapter 11, verse number one of Pasha Shemini. God spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, so now she says, even though it says, it usually means Moses that he should say to Aaron, but actually he didn't speak to Moshe and Aaron together. To who should they say, to whom should they, they the Lord said that Aaron should tell Eliezer and his son, or perhaps it means to tell the Israelites. However, when the scripture says in verse number two, speak to the children of Israel, speak to Israel is already mentioned. So what do I understand when it says, says to them? For the Aaron should tell it to his sons, till he has into his summer. And in turn, were all the children of Israel, Lord as follows. It was a system. Moshe told Aaron, and then in front of Moshe Rabbeinu, Aaron told Eliezer in his summer. And in front of Eliezer's summer, and the Moshe and Aaron, Eliezer and Sada told it to the elders. So this was a process that ultimately every single um, Jew, uh, every single Jew ultimately heard it a couple of times as it was repeated in front of Moshe and Aaron. So that this, as, as we learned, that you know, there shouldn't be any mistakes. It shouldn't be a situation that things would, would, would be a mistake in it, but that everyone would, would, uh, would say it exactly the way they make sure that at least for the fourth or fifth time it was said in front of the Moshe Rabbeinu. So if somebody changed it, would, would God forbid change it, Moshe Rabbeinu would be the one who would say that, that no, that, that's not what I said. Verse number two, that woman Israel speak to the Jewish people and tell them, Lamer saying, this is the animal that you're allowed to eat. We call behema ashela all the animals that are on the earth. Now she says, Daba bnei Yisrael. What does the Torah over here teach us? God made them all, namely Moshe and Aaron, Lez and the Sami, equal messengers for relaying the following speech. And why did Aaron and his son deserve such special honor? because they will all equally remain silent, accepting God's decree when, when, they, when Nadal and Avir died. Zoysa Chaya, the word Chaya is a living creature, denotes Chayim, life. In the context of this passage, which sets out the clean and unclean creatures, the meaning is expounded as follows. Since the Jews cleave to, the, to God and are therefore worthy of being alive, Accordingly, God separated them from uncleanliness and decreed commandments upon them so that they, that through these commandments, the Jews would live. They have a, they have a, a spiritual life. With other nations, however, he prohibited nothing. They were not obligated to, to eat not eat kosher. This is comparable to a physician who went to visit a patient who was incurable and allowed him to eat anything he wished. They went to a patient who was to recover. The physician imposed restrictions on a diet that he would ensure that the, the recoverable patient would live. So to the nations in the land of Israel, as is found in the Medrash Tan Choma. This is the creature. Teaches us that Moshe would hold up, show and tell. Moshe Rabbeinu showed each and every one exactly what he was talking about. This is one you eat, and this one you're not in. This is eat to the following. Even the creatures of the water, he held them up, one of every species, and showed it to them. And likewise with the birds. <laughs> you should hold these as an abomination. When you say these, it means that he showed them exactly what these were. So he showed them every single Jew. He showed them every animal that was prohibited and that was permit permitted.
The word chaya, although usually denotes an undomesticated animal, such as a deer, also has the meaning as a living creature. In general, the word behema usually denoting domesticated animals like cattle. Also, the meaning of larger animals, or mammals. You see this in the verse, but it says these are the creatures chaya that you may eat amongst the animals. Behema on the earth. Thus, teaching us the behema is included in the word chaya. So these two words, chaya and behema, go backwards and forwards in the Torah. So using chaya means an undomesticated animal. Behema means a, a domesticated animal. But sometimes they're interchanged, these two words, chaya, because chaya means any living animal. Behema means an animal. Verse 3. Koma freses pras. Any animal that has cloven hooves, the shesa shesa, pisces, it's not that it has cloven hooves, it's completely split, double hooves. A lot of times you look at animals, they look like they have a split, like the example of a pig, but it's not totally split. So it needs to be totally split like two different shoes. Or malas gaita, an animal that chews its cud, it has that's the sign of a kosher animal, has split hooves and chews its cud. So that says, parsa, mafreses, although resembling following word parsa, the word mafreses is understood as a targum translates to dika. Mafreses means it's split. Totally split, two different hooves. Parsa, my first is it's split. Parsa is hooves. Split or cloven wool hooves. Shosha shesa, meaning the hooves is completely separate from the top and the bottom in two nails. And the tiger renders mapaltov tilfin, meaning split into hooves, split into two hoof sections. Because there are animals whose hooves are split on the top, but not completely split and separate as two hooves. Since the bottom section of the hooves are connected, it would be unkosher. One means which chews its cud. So now she says it brings up and regurgitates the 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 food, the ingested food from its stomach, returning the food to its mouth in order to thoroughly crush and grind it thoroughly. Gaira, this is the name, the name of the food that the animal regurgitates. Possible stands for nigar, to drag or to flow as the waters which flow, for the regurgitated food flows back to the mouth. Tiger uncle renders the word gaita pirsha, dissolved, since through being regurgitated, the food is dissolved and melted. Bibahema, in the animal, this is an extra word, Rashi says, which, which to derive if a pregnant animal is slaughtered properly, bibahema means in the animal, the Gemara learns, the fetus inside the mother womb is permitted to be eaten. So it's like it's like part of the animal. Isa Tachelu, you may eat, but not an unclean animal. This is the negative inference, not already included in the explicit prohibition next in the verse four. You must not eat. Notwithstanding, this positive statement is included here. So the one who eats an unclean animal transgresses a positive and negative commandment. So eating a treif animal, not only do we do an avera, God forbid, but we also don't do a mitzvah. Not to eat. So in essence, treif has within it, non-kosher food has within it a positive and a negative. Verse 4. But these you shall not eat. Those that bring up its cut. Mafis is pasa, and those who have cloven hooves. As a gomel, 
For example, the, the camel, which brings up its cud. It does bring up its cud. But it doesn't have split hooves. So it's still impure too, because it has to have both sides. That's a shafat, the hyrex. This hyrex has split hooves, but for Paisalia, if it doesn't have any, 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 it doesn't have split. I mean, sorry, it does chew up, it regurgitates, it brings up its cud, but it doesn't have split hooves. Tamiluachem, Asad Nevis, and the hair. He might he, it does chew its cud. With five salay of fish, but doesn't have any hooves. Tamay he lochem. It's a chazir and the pig. He mafriz paisahu. It has split hooves. The shesa shesa paisa, and it's totally split. Who gave a laigra? But it doesn't regurgitate its cud. Tamay he lochem. So in essence, there are four animals in the world. This is one of the things that proves that the Abishta, that the Torah, there's only four animals in the world that have one and not the other. The camel and the, the camel regurgitates, regurgitates, and the hair regurgitates, and the, and, and the, and the hyrex regurgitates, but does not spill hoops. So those are only three animals in the world where we regurgitate donuts with hooves and, and, and there's only one animal in the world that has split hooves that doesn't regurgitate, that is a pig. So those are the four animals from the beginning of time until today that have one and not the other. Verse number eight. If suddenly say chelu from the meat, you're not allowed to eat. When they lost some lace to go, and from their dead body, you shouldn't touch you. To maim heim lachem, they are unclean to you. Rashi says, you now eat the flesh. I might only know these animals possess one sign of cleanliness, are prohibited from eating. How about with things that doesn't have anything signs? How do we know the other clean animals which have no signs of cleanness altogether? How do you know that they are not allowed to eat? So how do you know you're not allowed to eat an animal that doesn't have any kind of a sign, like a lion, a tiger? They don't chew, they don't have split hooves, and they don't have chew their cud. So how do we know you're not allowed to eat those? So that's how we learn from a kalva chayma. Here's the inference of a kalva chayma, from a minor to a mate. If an animal that has, has a part of the sign are of cleanliness are prohibited, how much more so those animals that lack signs of cleanliness? So that's the famous Klamachayma that we way we learn the Torah. So even though the Torah doesn't mention about a lion, so you might say, why can't I eat a lion? Or a horse? A horse. Because the Torah, if something that doesn't have one is not acceptable, for sure something that has nothing is not acceptable. Mipsaram this is, this is an important law because we comes out of many different laws about the about the animal's parts. So the Torah says the Torah prohibits eating the flesh of the animal, if Sodom, but does not but does not the Torah does not include the, the bones or the sinews of those. So in the Torah is a prohibition on the flesh of the animal. That's an interesting prohibition. You're not allowed to touch a dead animal. Why not? One might think that Israelites are prohibited from touching a carcass of a dead animal. I mean, why not? Touch it? Unless you want to go to the temple. But if I'm regular, why, why uh, was I becoming pure? What's so terrible about it? However, it says to say to the Kehanim, shall not defile himself to dead person amongst the people. Thus, kayahanim are prohibited from the filings of the human corpse. But a normal Jew is not prohibited from becoming impure. Now, a kavachayma can be made. It's another kavachayma. Because over there, the Torah is talking about a dead person. Since more stringent cause of defilement by a human corpse, only kayahanim are prohibited. 
than a more lenient case of the farm of the animal carcass, how much more so should only kahana be prohibited? If so, why does scripture say you shall not touch the carcass? It means that in Israel, may not touch the animal carcass on the festival. So now we're coming to Pesach. It's important for us also as regular Jews, in the time of Beis Hamidosh, or even in the time in the Beis Hamidosh, I kind of eat a carb Pesach. I, I have to make sure not to become defiled. So I have to make sure not to touch a dead animal. And the festival, since it's the time to deal with the holy sacrifice, enter the temple. This is why the sages said a person is obligated to cleanse himself on the festival, to make sure that he doesn't go to doesn't touch a dead body, something, and also that a regular Jew doesn't touch in the time of the festival a dead carcass. But on a regular time, a regular Jew can go to the can get a common pure, go to a dead, uh, even to, he's even obligated to come impure. It's a mitzvah to go to a funeral, to become impure. And also, you can touch a dead animal. So this law, Ashi says, when the Lassam Alti go, the Gemara teaches us, is not talking about a regular situation. It's talking about in the time of Yantu. Number nine. Amongst these creatures are you to eat in the water. Any fish that has fins and scales, by Yamim, by Mayim, and Acholim, those that are you may eat in the waters, the seas, and the rivers. Now she says, fins, these are the wing like, and which give it the capability to swim. Kaskeshes, these are the scales that are fixed to it. And it says, and they are wearing a coat of mail. It's like a, it's like the it, 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 scales, it looks like a coat of uh, armor. Verse 10, a creature that doesn't have fins and scales, whether they are in the seas or in the rivers, we call amongst all creeping creatures of the water, lobsters and shrimps and everything else, Sheketim Lachem, they are the abomination to a Jew. Tadasha, creeping, creeping creatures, anywhere this term appears in scripture, it denotes low creatures that slither, sliver, sliver, and moves on the ground. Sheketz Yelachem, it's an abomination to you. You shouldn't eat from its flesh. And even their dead bodies, you shall hold as an abomination. Now she says there shall be an abomination. The statement is repeated to prohibit the, their mixture. If the flesh of an unclean water creature was mixed with food of another type, it is, and is there enough of unclean flesh to impart its taste? It's an abomination. So that's said again, the word mipsodom from their flesh. Only their flesh is prohibited. But again, their fin, the the you allowed to eat the fins and the bones. Apitoida, according to the Torah, you can eat the bones. The rabbis prohibited it. As the vlasim teshaketu. This clause comes to include midgids. Evushin that are filtered out of the water of the liquids. One may indigest these creatures together with the water. But once they have become separate from the original source, they are prohibited. So these are, because Filtered, I mean, water. Water has something. Everything has something in, in it. There's like these creations. There's like these. You have to look at a microscope. You can see. You can see. You know. There's always something in the water that you drink. So that was a big, big to do that in 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 New York that they found these creatures in the water and they asked everybody to put filters. It was a ganze thing. But ultimately, there's so many things in everything that you eat. So the so the Torah prohibits that she says something once you separate it from from in, in there, but once you it's still in the water, 
that you cannot see it. You don't separate it. It's hard to. You can't separate it from the from from the place that it's in. Then it's then it's not a prohibition. Verse 12. Any creature that does not have fins and scales in the water is an abomination. That sounds like a repetition. What the scripture, Dashi says, what the teacher says. In verse 10, it says that already, right? I might think that the water creatures are permitted only if it brings up its signs of cleanliness, namely fins and scales into the dry land, but if it sheds them in the water, there are certain, there are certain fish that loses its skin, fins and scales. How do we know that these creatures are permitted? Scripture there says, any creature does not have fins and scales in the water, but it had them while in the water, even if it shed them, when it in its emergence into the dry land, it's permitted. And I forgot there is a certain fish that actually has this situation. Verse number 13. These are the birds that you should not eat. From the from the from the birds. Shakat saying the abomination to you. It's a nesha, the eagle, and the griffin vulture, sapetus. The kite, that's Azniya and the osprey. Lo yechelu, they shall not be eaten. Now she says, Scripture is telling us that one may not feed them to minors. We derive this in the passive voice, be eaten, meaning that these birds may not be eaten through you, or perhaps it may not may not be so, but it's telling us that in addition to not eating them. One may not derive any benefit for them. Therefore, scripture state you're not allowed to eat. Any of these animals, safer animals, you're not allowed to eat, but you can sell really to for animals. Is an active voice teaching us that one is prohibited eating them, but permitted to derive benefit from them. Now, even if mentioned now, now in every mention of a bird which scripture says, liminehu, limina, limina. It's because within that species, there are some that resemble each other, neither in appearance nor in name, but they are nevertheless all one species. So that's what you find by the Torah over here, by the birds, you'll see continuous limina, limina, because there are many hundreds of species of birds. Asada, the kestrel, Vesaya and the vulture, Limina, to its species, the um, hundred, I don't know how many vulture species there are. Esaida and the raven, Limina to its species. Vesabasiana and the ostrich, Vesatachmos and the jay, Vesashafach and the sparrow hawk, Vesanates and the goshawk. Lemina, Leminehu, to its species. Asha's Nates is the Ospreva in Old French. Note that according to some editions in Ashi, the reading is Aster, which is translated Green, Greensburg or the Goshawk. Voucher in the modern French. This could, so as you can see, the way learning in Ashi, there are many, many other commentators on this uh, in the meaning of each of these words. Esa kois, the owl. Esa sholof, and the gull. Esa yan shayf, and the little owl. The gull, our rabbi, is a sholof, is a bird that draws up fish out of the sea. And this is the meaning of unkelish, translates sholof, sholchanet, the fish catcher. The owl and the little owl, these are 
in old French owl that shirk in the night, which have cheeks like those of a human. There's another bird similar, it's called kibui. Verse 18, Esatin Shemes, the bat, Vesaka and the starling, Vesarocham and the magpie. You, have, you can have pictures of all these animals. Hunting Shemes, this is like, that is the Kal, sorry, it's old French, it resembles a mouse that flies at night. So that's, that's the bat. Hunting Shemes mentioned among the creeping animals, resembles this one in so far as no eyes. It's called a tal P. A mole in English. As a chasida, the stork, hanafa, limina, the heron, after its species, as a duchvis and the hopi, as a talif and the and the al talif, and that's why the Rav show exactly what that means. So Rasha chasida, this is the white daya called Zigona in Old French. And why is it called Chasida? Chasida means a kind one because it does kindness with its fellow birds by sharing its food. So that's a stork. It brings those to the babies to the house. Anafa, he had daya, this is the hot-tempered daya. And it appears to me that the bird called a heron. No friend, we see a lot of herons in Florida. Haduchvis, Tainagal Habar, a Hopi is a wild rooster which has double crest. It's called a hirpu in French. It's called Duchvis because its glory, namely its crest, is bound up, coffers, combs double, appears to be folded into the head and bound up there. Uncle is rendered a Nagatura, a mountain carpenter named so for what it does, as explained by our rabbis in the Gemara. Kol Shedetayf, Ahelacharaba, any flying insects, that walks on four is an abomination to you. But actually, these are the these are delicate and small creatures that crawl on the ground, like flies, hornets, mosquitoes, locusts. Now the Torah permits a certain locust. However, amongst all flying insects that walk on four legs, you may eat. Those that have joint leg like legs, extension above its regular legs, to hop on the ground. So that's a certain kind of a locust that has uh, four legs, above meaning high up on the creature's body, namely near its neck. It has two legs like extension besides its regular four legs. When it wishes to fly or hop from the ground, it bolsters itself firmly on these two appendages, these two legs, and flies. In our regions, we have many of these sort of flying creatures called langosta, sea locusts. But they're no longer proficient and identified which ones are clean and which ones are unclean. And what specific problems we have with this identification? There are four signs of a clean enumerated regarding these creatures. Number one has four legs. Number two has four wings. Number three, which are joint legs like extensions described above. Number four, the wings that cover the majority of the body. All these signs are indeed found in the creature among, among us today. But some creatures have long heads and some do not have tails. And reading is, some have tails and some must bear the name Chagav, 
concerning this requirement, Lamy, which type official called Chagav and which is not. We no longer know how to distinguish amongst them. But there are some Jews and some Tamanic tame, Jews that do have a tradition of a, of a certain locus and that they can eat and they do eat in the land of Israel. They do eat a certain kind of a Chagav. But most Jews do not eat locusts um, at this present time, grasshoppers at this present time. Verse number 22. And from these locusts, from these grasshoppers, you could eat as I believe the red locust to its species, as a sloil and the yellow locust to its species, as a chag and the spotted gray locust for its species, as a chagov, and the white locust to its species. And any other flying insect that has four legs, sheketsu lachem is an abomination to you. The verse 20 already said any flying insects that walk on four is an abomination to you. Why is it repeated here? It comes to teach us that if it has five legs, it is clean. If you find a locust that has five, it will become clean. Verse 23, 4. And all these animals, and when they're dead, you're going to become tummy to them. You're going to have impure. A kosher animal that's dead, you don't become tummy to because then you wouldn't be able to eat. So all the kosher animals that you eat, they're dead. They don't become tummy in their death. A non-kosher animal is not tummy when they're alive. You cannot eat it. But they're not tummy. They don't become impure when they're alive. But when they're dead, now they become tummy. Like a dog. A dog is not a kosher animal. You can't eat a dog. And you can touch a dog. But if the dog is dead, now the dog or the cat becomes tummy. And you're not allowed to become tummy. I mean, we're talking about the time based on Mikdash. Today, it's not a problem. But the tumor is a very lenient tumor. And you become tummy only for the day, and you go to the mikvah at night, and you turn. So we become unclean through these animals that are enumerated below. They're touching them. Their uncleanliness, not that they become meant to become unclean. Anyone who carries their carcass, he has to go to the mikvah, he his clothes, and he's tummy until the evening. Any place scripture that mentions tummy masa, unclean is required by carrying an unclean item, is more stringent than maga, than touching an unclean item. In so far as it requires immersion in the garments. So if I carry the animal, now not only I have to go to the mikvah, but my clothes have to go to the mikvah, so to say. But if I touch it on a, a dead carcass of an unclean animal, I only go to the mikvah, that's it. Any animal that has cloven hooves and is not completely split, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it doesn't bring up its cud. They are, if they're dead, they are unclean. Whoever touches them becomes unclean. For instance, the camel whose hooves are split on the top, but the bottom is connected. Here, scripture teaches us that the carcass of an unclean animal defiles. On the section end of the parsha, scripture explains the carcass of a clean animal defiles as well. However, scripture deals with these separately. So there's a difference between the two. The case of a clean animal is carcass of files only if it dies. Natural death, somebody killed it. But if it's slaughtered properly, even if it was a trefa, it had a fatal disease or injury, its carcass does not defile. As I told you before, a kosher animal that is slaughtered is not, can't def, doesn't defile anybody. But if you have a dead animal, dead cow on the side of the road, 
that died a natural cause, or somebody hit it, or somebody shot it, then its carcass does the fire. But a dead animal, a kosher dead animal, it doesn't make a difference if you shecht it, it's like a dead animal because you cannot eat it. So even if I shecht a pig, the pig will always defile. Verse 27, any animal, amongst all the animals that walk on four legs, walks on four legs, like a dog, as Ashi says, Anyone who touches their carcass, come clean until the evening. Always says until the evening, because again, the mikveh, we went, we used to go to mikveh to purify, say, in the end of the day, in the evening. Akarpav on its paws, the dog, bear, cat, they're unclean to you to touch in the dead carcass. Verse 20, Anesis of Lot. And if you carry them, you carry the dead animal, not only you become a poor, you have the mercy of garments, and the garments become impure until the, until the evening. To mayim heim lachem, they are impure to you. And these clean, unclean for you among creeping creatures that creep in the ground, achelad, the weasel, Achba, the mouse, Patsov, and a toad, the Mineu after their species. And these are the unclean for you. All these statements of uncleanliness are not referring to the prohibition of eating, but rather to actual uncleanliness, meaning that a person will become unclean by touching them. And he will constantly be prohibited eating truma, portion of one produce and given to kind, and a holy sacrifice and entering the sanctuary. Hachela the, the, is a, a weasel. Sov is a bat in old French which resembles a frog. According to verse 30, Anka, the hedgehog, Akoyach Ma'alota, the camel and the lizard, Achaymish went the snail and the mole. The hedgehog, the herizen. Her no French lizard, the snail, the mole, talpi. lachem. These are the ones that are unclean to you. Whoever touches these animals in the while well, in the dead, yitma the other they become pure into mehem. If any of these dead creatures fall upon anything, the Mesa, in their death, Yitma Makal creates whatever is any wooden vessel, vessel, garment, hide, or sack, any vessel, Kal Kli Malacha, any vessel which work is done for him in them. Bamayim Yovai, and they were immersed in water. All these vessels and these garments become impure until the evening. And when you go to the mikvah in the evening, all these things will become pure. The Rashi's even after immersion, the item remains unclean for coming in contact with Truma. Ada Arev until the evening. So if I went to the mikveh earlier, that's called a tful yoyim. I went to the mikveh earlier, it's still tame until the evening. And it becomes tar ba'erev, the evening. The tar ba'erev ashemesh, it comes clean when the sun sets. That completes the chumash of two. We now go to the Tanya Midday. We are holding in chapter 38, I believe. Yeah, chapter 38, Tanya. So for the beginning of chapter 35 of Tanya, the Alter Rebbe has found the phrase to do it. The Alter Rebbe coined the phrase, just do it. 
not Nike, Al Just do it. The conclusion of verse, and that's kind of the that was the that was Al Tadeb's whole tani based on the verse. It caught of a lecha dove meoit, the ficha is near to you in your mouth, the ficha of a la asaise to do it. Just do it. He explained that mitzvahs of action, of speech, which is deemed an action, are paramount importance since it's through them that we achieve the goal of transforming this physical world into a dwelling place of God in the lower realms. Just do it. Meaning a place where godness will be revealed. To even a greater degree than the higher spiritual worlds, because when they, because that's the will of God to come into this low world. So when the, and that's once I do the will of God, it is a revealed will of Hakadosh Baruch Hu. I reveal the true will of Hakadosh Baruch Hu. So in the upper worlds, with the knowledge, you'll never have a total knowledge. But over here, when I do a mitzvah, I reveal the purpose and the why the Abish to created this concept. This goal we realize when an energy of the vital soul in the body of every Jew will ascend from Klippat Noga to holiness. That's what the journey is. The journey of the Jewish nation is to elevate themselves in general, in particular, and ultimately in general, because we have ultimately one neshama, and therefore we are responsible for each other <coughs> to ultimately elevate the world Elevate our existence, elevate the world. That's what our job is here. So since the entire process hinges on the elevation of the Jewish body and the vital soul, and since their elevation is accomplished by only the means of a mitzvah and of action, just do it, which requires the power and the performance of mitzvah, therefore the mitzvahs of action are, as said, a paramount importance. And the Alter Rebbe said, the most important mitzvah is stucco. That's it. You need to do the mitzvah stucco because it encompasses everything. That's why stucco will redeem the Jewish nation. In the discussion now follows, the Alter Rebbe will examine the other side of the coin. He will explain the importance of kavana, meditation. Kavana, devout concentration or intention in the performance of mitzvahs. If it's just do it, then really I don't have to have kona, just do it. Who cares, Who don't put your two cents into it, just do it. But the Alter Rebbe says, no, there's an importance in Kavana. There is an importance, I'm not taking away the importance. I don't want the Kavana should stop to do it, but you should have Kavana. If you have the capability to have Kavana, it's surely very important. Because, as they will explain, as used in the concept of kavana, referring to the motive intentions that by performing in the mitzvah, one is united with God, who commanded, and will and, and and will each mitzvah represents. So why is it important? So now the Alter Rebbe explains. Achafo became yet nevertheless, even though I brought out the greatness of action. Amru, the sage, has also said, If somebody says a blessing, or he davens, without kavana, is keguf b'lei neshama. It's like a body without a soul. You're missing the flavor. You're missing the life in it. Perush, what is the meaning of the statement? That a mitzvah without kavana is like a body without a soul. Just like all creatures in this world possess guf and neshama. Everything in this world is a vessel and a light, a body and a soul. That's the way everything in the world is. That's the way I am. I'm a body and a soul. Two different entities that come together and live together. But ultimately, they're two different entities. Meaning the nefesh, the soul of every living being, and the ruach of all flesh, and the neshama of all that has breath and life in its nostrils amongst living creatures. 
So here you see the three words that, I, that the Alter Rebbe always uses in the Neshama. Three levels in the Neshama. Nefesh kolchai. The nefesh of every living thing. Ruach kol basar. The spirit of everything. V'nishmas kol asher rebbe rochai. Nefesh, ruach, neshama. Everything has a nefesh, which is the closest to it's the phys- it's closest to its physicality, has a ruach, which is the emotion of its physicality, the spirit, and it has a neshama, which is the intellectual part of its capacity. And then you have God that gives the life of it, right? That's the source, is the Abishta. Umahava Isam. The life, right? So the, 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 the life of the soul. Right? Nefeshuch Nisham, you have Chaya. The life, godly life that gives this Nefeshuch Nisham life. That gives its existence. Which the vitality which he bestows upon them, meaning upon both the soul and the body, and supports it. His connection that the body too has a godly life force, a siphon soul. Dr. Rebbe adds parenthetically, because ultimately, even a body, I feel a one of the offer, because even stones and earth, has some kind of life force. So the body, even though the soul departs, it's still, it's still there. It ultimately turns to decomposes, but it's still there. So the body is still there. So something is giving it life. The life doesn't leave the body the second the soul leaves the body because the life, the body itself has a certain life force in it. Take a, take, take a, take a fruit, you tear it off the tree. It's still there. Slowly, if you're not going to eat it, it will it will go away, the life force will go away and return to earth. But it's still there because everything has some aspect that gives it life existence. It shouldn't return to nothing like it was. So everything has a life force. Your soul has a life force and your, your body has a life force. So both your body and soul, even though your soul and your body are two different entities, but your body and soul, each one have their own life force. Difference is, again, your body will ultimately return to its source, which is earth, which also so it comes back to earth, which is also a living entity. So ultimately, the body even is not totally destructive because it goes back to earth, to its source and element, which the majority of the body is earth, besides water. Is earth. From earth you come, to earth you shall return. So therefore, ultimately, the body also does not, so to say, just totally destroy, go to nothing. But if you take away the godly power in this body, the body will turn taka to nothing, not to earth, but to nothing. So further in the Tanya, the Alter Rebbe explains that every existing being would be instantly revert to absolute nothingness. Not that it's going to return to earth or to air or to water or to, you know, the four elements that I, everything is made out of. That doesn't mean nothing. Returning to another element is not nothing. Taking away the godly energy, even in the nothing, in the earth, will return everything to nothing, really nothing, to never have any. So if you would revert to absolute nothingness, that's what means when you take away the godly entity. When you take you, when you take away uh, you, uh, anything in the world, you you separate it from all its entities to its source. Like you mentioned, learned yesterday, the paraduma. You take the animal, you burn it, and you bring it back to its to its basic is ashes. Take it, ashes. That's what it ultimately comes to. Earth. Ashes is ultimately earth. But that's something too. 
when you when God decides not to give something an energy, then it returns to nothing, like it never was. Thus, even the inanimate being contained a life force, and so surely do the bodies of living creatures. So everything has a life force in it. Now the Rebbe now concludes that the sentence began earlier. Just as in all creatures of this world, possessing a body and soul, there is nevertheless meaning. Despite the fact that the body and the soul are alike in that both contain a divine life force. Right? So really, what's the difference between body and soul? The soul has a godly entity. The body without the soul also has a godly entity. So you might say, that's going back. Just do it. Because in every physical thing, just do it. It has a godly entity. No comparison or similarity in the quality of light and life force radiating in the body and the life force radiating in the neshama. But there's no comparison. How are we going to explain it? It's very, it's, there's no comparison because ultimately the body becomes earth. So its life force is very, very, very minute. While the godly soul, the soul lives on. So the soul is much greater than the body. Even though they're ultimately both from, the, from God. But one is a much greater revelation well, one is a very, very low, 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 low uh, energy. And we all can understand the difference. Now, to that, we end the chitas over here, but the analogy we can understand, as Al Tadeb is going to say tomorrow. So we all can understand the analogy. The Gemara says doing a mitzvah is like doing, is like a guf, Balayna Shama. Doing a mitzvah without kavana is like a body without a soul. The Gemara is giving that analogy. The Gemara is saying, you might say, what's the difference in the body and the soul? Both are godly. There's a great difference. The body is, is godly, but it has, doesn't have the revelation of godliness like the soul. And therefore, the mitzvah is very great, but it doesn't have that revelation when you do it with kavana, when you connect the soul to it when you connect yourself to it, when you bring your emotions and your intellect and your comprehension to the mitzvah, wow, then you have a mitzvah that has the body just the doing it and it has the soul, has the godliness, it has the excitement, it has the focus, it has the whole beauty of this mitzvah. And then you have like a body and a soul that live together. And that's the beauty of kavana, as the out kavana, the intention of the mitzvah, doing the mitzvah with intention, with, 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 with excitement, with heart, with love, and with devotion, and with understanding, which brings about devotion and love in the, in the heart. That's the soul of the mitzvah. That's the soul of the mitzvah. Chasidut is the soul of the Torah. In, in, in Chassidus we learn that learning Chassidus is the soul of the Torah. It's the geshmak. Sure, you can learn Torah and just do, you know, do in the don'ts. But you can learn Chassidus, which will give you the soul of the Torah, the beauty, the kavana, the intention, the excitement. And that's the soul of everything. And therefore, that completes the time of the day. I hope that everybody will learn the chitas tomorrow, the chumash, and the tanya that uh, is on Shabbat by yourself. Today is the 20, today is the 22nd day of the month, which is chapter 104 and 100, 106, 107. 106 and 107, if you do chapter 106, 107, you would do the chitas of the day. And I wish you all a wonderful and beautiful Shabbos. Have a wonderful Shabbos, a happy Shabbos, a beautiful Shabbos, Shabbos, Shabbos Parah. 
it's a it's a extra reading today the portion of paraduma the, the concept of uh, purification and going out of impurities of this world and I'll meet you all in Mitch Hashem first of all, I hope I'll meet you all in Shul tomorrow and if not I'll meet you all in Mitch Hashem on Sunday 8 a.m. We'll start a new Pasha, new portion of the week, and new and continue the chitas of the of the Tanya. I wish you all Shabbat Shalom, beautiful, happy, and healthy Shabbos.